Good afternoon and welcome to today's fireside chat, Resiliency and Friendship, Reflections on 311. We are proud to bring you today's program as part of the National Cherry Blossom Festival here in Washington, DC. With the festival being virtual this year, we are thrilled to be able to welcome guests from across the US and even some in Japan who are joining us at the late hour of 1 a.m. Thank you so much. My name is Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. I will be your moderator for today's event. Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan for the benefit of a free and open international community. Its activities mainly focus on security and diplomacy through the engagement of exchanges, dialogue, analysis, publications, and networking. Just a few housekeeping issues I'd like to go over. Today's event is being recorded and is on the record. A recap and video recording will be made available on Sasakawa USA's website in the coming weeks. We will have a Q&A session later in the hour. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. You can submit questions at any time throughout the discussion and we'll answer them at the end. As many of you know, the Tohoku region of Japan suffered catastrophic destruction and loss of life on March 11th, 2011, when the Great East Japan earthquake struck Northern Japan, causing a disastrous tsunami and nuclear event. Today's event is to pay tribute to all those who lost their lives and those who showed extraordinary resiliency in the wake of the triple disaster that shook Japan 10 years ago. It's important that we remember the tragic loss of life. I know many of you here with us today were personally impacted by that fateful day and some of you were actually there. I'd like to take this occasion for us all to pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. So now why we're here, I would like to introduce our three distinguished speakers we have here with us today. Ambassador Roos, Miss Susan Susie Roos, and Miss Suzanne Basala, please join me on the virtual stage. Hello, so wonderful to have you here with us. Hi. Uh, each of yes, thank you. Uh, each of these, uh, you know, each of you played a critical role in the on the ground US response to the Great East Japan earthquake, taking both personal and institutional risk to do so. Through their personal stories of being in Tokyo on March 11th, 2011, and in the days and months that followed, we'll hear about the challenges they faced and the triumphs of humanity they witnessed. The reflections weave together the resiliency, friendship, and hope they encountered. Each speaker has a long list of accolades and accomplishments, but due to our short time together, I'll briefly introduce each guest. First, we have Ambassador John Roos. Hello, Ambassador Roos. Hi. Co-founder of Geodesic Capital. From 2009 to 2013, Ambassador Roos served as the US Ambassador to Japan. In addition to serving as the Ambassador during the Great East Japan earthquake of March 11th, 2011, he also became the first sitting U.S. ambassador ever to attend the commemoration ceremony of the atomic bombings in Hiroshima. Next, we have Ms. Susan, or Susie Roos, who is partner and CAO of Geodesic Capital. Prior to Geodesic, Ms. Roos was an employment and labor attorney working for 34 years in the legal career field. As the wife of Ambassador Roos, she was an active voice supporting efforts to empower women in the workplace in Japan while there and played an active role in the US response to the Great East Japan earthquake. Thank you for joining us. And last but definitely, lot, and last but definitely not least, we have Ms. Suzanne Basala, President and Chief Executive Officer of the US Japan Council. Ms. Basala is a former officer of the US Navy, which included assignments in Japan, the Pentagon, and Diego Garcia. From 2010 to 2012, she served as a senior advisor to Ambassador Roos at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo, supporting him on 
a full portfolio of security, economic, political, and cultural issues in the U.S.-Japan relationship. So as you can see, our three guests are very well versed in um, U.S.-Japan relations and um, having been in Japan at the time. So I would just love to jump right in um, to this fireside chat we have. I wish that we could be in person uh, sitting on couches and chairs next to each other, um, but I look forward to that in the hopefully coming months uh, that we can do that. But first, I'd just like to start off um, and have you take us back to you know that day, March 11th, 2011, and those days that followed. You know, what were your initial reactions to the earthquake, both uh, personally and professionally? And Ambassador Roos, if you could kick it kick it off for us. Well, first of all, Shanti and Sasa Khalif, uh, thank you for hosting us. And uh, obviously, our hearts and thoughts are with the people of Tohoku during this uh, ten-year reflection on the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis. I love the fact that we're doing this uh, Zoom meeting with uh, my first opportunity to do one with Susie and Suzanne. And we were really a team during this period of time. So uh, I really look forward to the next hour. I will tell you, uh, when the earthquake first happened, Suzanne and I were in the embassy uh, in my office. Susie was over in the residence. And the level of intensity was so massive that quite frankly, we thought the embassy was gonna collapse and we were gonna die. Um, once we got over that shock, uh, we evacuated the embassy and things really happened in a flash. Um, the team surrounding me as the ambassador was fantastic. We contacted the White House, the State Department. I had a conversation uh, over the telephone with General Field, the head of US Forces Japan we declared an emergency. We began to see pictures of the tsunami, which obviously were sobering. Um, and then I was informed uh, by one of the staff members, the Japanese staff members, that the Ministry of Defense had uh, said that there was a nuclear situation up at Fukushima, which quite frankly, I had never heard of uh, before that moment. And things went from there and events moved so quickly. Uh, everything from just making sure everyone was safe and out of the embassy um, to mobilizing the resources of the U.S. government and the military to help in any way we could. So like, so like John said, you know, I, I was at, at the residence at the time and um, it's a very strong building. So it, I didn't feel it, I didn't ever think it was going to come down or anything. And in fact, I, I was, um, typing with one of my legal colleagues at the time on the on my computer and I remember typing to him oh we're having an earthquake so it kind of started slow and it went on for a long time and then it kept going and going and going and I was like oh my goodness I better figure out what's going on so we stayed inside for a while and then finally the staff and I, I said we need to go outside to the backyard so we had this big yard behind the house. Um, I don't know if some of you obviously know what it's like. And so eventually we, uh, we all went back there and we were standing like in the backyard and it's, you know, moving around and you can see all the people coming out of the Okura and all the people coming out of the office buildings. And it was just, and uh, all of a sudden, um, one of John's security guys comes up to me and he, we're outside with all the staff people. And he says, you know, ma'am, ambassador has sent me up here to to get you and he wants you down in the parking lot. And I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going down to there. And he said, oh, you know, ma'am, he, he wants you to come down to the parking lot. And I said, <clears throat> uh, look around, uh, you see this big yard? There's no way that a, a building's gonna fall on me. And down in that parking lot, there's all these big buildings around you. I think it's safer up here. And he looks around and he goes, yeah. I think you're right. And he stayed with me and he didn't go back down to the parking lot for a few minutes. So, um, you know, I was, I was, I was very touched that my wife wanted to be by my side during the biggest crisis of my <laughs> right, career. Right, right. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Thank you so much. And how about for you, uh, Suzanne, I, maybe you were in the embassy as well at that time. Right. So John and I, uh, Master Bruce and I were in a, a meeting at the same time. So we ended up eventually getting under doorways. And so John was under his doorway and I was under Jim Zumwalt, the DCM's doorway. And there were other people with us as well, just kind of watching each other. And I think 
for those of us who were there, just remembering how long it lasted. And, and as the ambassador said, you're just, as it's growing, you're thinking, okay, what, what's this gonna be like when it's over? Um, <clears throat> and then I, the other thing I really remember from that day is uh, after we left the parking lot, uh, m- many of us went over to the embassy compound. A lot of you know, the embassy compound is just a few minutes walk away from the embassy, but there was still this sense of uncertainty and helplessness and like, what do we do? Because we were still setting up the alternate command center at the residence. A lot of people didn't have their, their kids home yet. So it's causing a lot of uncertainty. The phones weren't um, allowing us to be in touch with folks. My husband happened to have been out that day on the trains. And, uh, you know, it's an amazing story of the Japanese system that the train stopped before the earthquake at a local station and rode out the earthquake, but he was out past Yokohama. So to, he didn't get home till one o'clock uh, in the morning and we, it was hard to reach him. So I, I remember also just a sense of there's such a huge issue and not yet understanding what role we were going to play, but knowing it was going to be massive. So. Yeah, yeah, so I, like for me at the house, I didn't realize the tsunami. So uh, I, I did, I went, I think I ran down to the parking lot eventually when it cut, when one of the aftershocks mm. and, and I saw John and it was, it was just a lot of commotion and things going on down there. But up at the house, you know, people couldn't get home. Like Suzanne said, I mean, I know the, all of you that were there and the kids were still in school and the buses couldn't get home. And so our, the residence itself became like a central place for all the people that worked in the embassy that couldn't get back to their homes. So about 30 or so people slept over there that night. Um, uh, my friends who lived in surrounding areas, you know, just they all came over and we sat in the dining room. I remember trying to communicate with the buses at ASIJ, trying to figure out what everything was doing. And they set up these TVs around uh, in the dining room. That's when we, when I first saw the um, tsunami. And so yeah. Um, it was just, just kind of all getting up Let me just add something that, uh, so Susie and I in 1989 were at uh, Candlestick Park for the World Series when the 1989 earthquake struck. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously the 9.1 earthquake in uh, Tohoku that hit the, you know, the Tokyo area uh, was massively bigger. But was, what was unnerving to all of us um, during those following hours and really weeks after was the aftershocks, hundreds of which yeah. were bigger than the 1989 San Francisco earthquake. So we were um, trying to focus, needed to focus. Uh, the, all of our responsibilities were enormous. Um, but at the same time, there was this constant earth shaking and trying to accomplish things when um, People were unnerved by that uh, was an incredible challenge. I'm sure all of you mentioned, you know, communication being a a challenge. um, And Ambassador Roos, you're communicating with Washington. You know, you're in charge of um, U.S. citizens um, uh, securing their safety, protecting them in Japan, and also, you know, lending a hand of support to Japan and uh, communicate with military, government. Um, I'm sure that was really complicated and all of you had your own personal uh, communication issues going on um, with your loved ones. But, you know, what was, um, how did you handle that Ambassador Roos, those communication issues? Well, it, it, Shanti, you're right. It was incredibly challenging. Uh, all these different stakeholders were converging uh, on the embassy at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, we had Washington, but not only Washington, but Washington was divided into the State Department, the White House that had its own thoughts about how things should be handled. All the different agencies that were involved, and I think there were a couple of dozen of agencies um, mm-hmm. that really were involved every step of the way. We had foreign governments that were looking to us. Um, I ended up having meetings with the UK uh, ambassador and the Australian ambassador and the Canadian ambassador on a continual basis because all these foreign governments were looking to the U.S. um, for guidance. Mm -hmm. The military, um, you know, we have a lot of our leaders on this uh, Zoom today, uh, which I grew to respect immeasurably, Um, but they were doing Operation Tomodachi and we were coordinating with that. And then, of course, there was the Japanese citizens that were looking to the U.S for accurate information. And then we were dealing with the government of Japan and everyone was on different time zones. 
<laughs> so it was uh, obviously um, an incredible challenge that I don't think anyone uh, could have done even close to perfectly, but you know, we did the best we could given the circumstances. I think yeah. one thing that we all learned was that there is a process in place that Ambassador Roos um, declared an emergency and that triggered the this, this system that was in place for uh, whenever there's a disaster overseas and it's led by USAID. And so what they did is they deployed a DART, Disaster Assistance Response Team, I think is the yes. acronym. And so immediately uh, without red tape, uh, the, uh, resources, expertise started to come to the embassy. Uh, and then outside of that DART structure, there were also a lot of the agencies that you know, have relationships with Japan started sending experts out to, to help us. And so pretty quickly, we had um, like 150 or something additional people in the embassy uh, helping us as extra staff mm -hmm. and bringing expertise that just didn't exist in the embassy at all. Uh, and, and we had to figure out how to organize them, but they also self-organized. You know, they would find each other. They knew how to work together. They would kind of just group in a room and, and then you would have a cluster of people working on the similar issues. But it, the big challenge I felt from my perspective supporting the ambassador was having to completely transition what kind of information was important, what kind of uh, you know, how to get that information to the ambassador in an organized and timely way so he could make decisions uh, because everything, the kinds of things we cared about were so different than prior to March 11th. And I'm sure you had a lot of um, incomplete information as well or information that, you know, do you trust it? Because it might be something that must have been very challenging as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, particularly, um, with the nuclear situation as that was developing. Um, we would have in our office, because there was all this conflicting information and even on the same information, experts had different views. Mm -hmm. So we would convene at least twice a day in the morning and, and in the evening, um, the experts, the nuclear regulatory experts, the Department of Energy, the uh, the uh, Navy nuclear reactor experts, even at some point in time, um, the White House science and technology advisor um, mm -hmm. would um, provide his advice. And one of the things that we were always trying to do was filter out and make judgments on what was real, what was the risk. Um, and it was, it was, it reminded me very much of what's been going on with COVID um, mm -hmm. right now. Okay, yeah, that must have been challenging. And Susie, I know, um, you know, Ambassador Roos and Suzanne, you were in the embassy and kind of official people. Susie, I know as Ambassador's wife, there's a lot of support roles that you played as well. I'd be curious to hear more about um, your involvement and um, the areas you worked in. Well, over the, fir the first weekend, like I said, that um, people were staying in our house mm -hmm. and um, the, the resident, the re uh, many of you might know that the residence is kind of just up on a tiny little hill from the embassy. So you can walk down the back steps and kind of be at both places. So we, we, they were going down to the embassy, um, but it was so still so many aftershocks and it was so dangerous or felt we felt it was dangerous that mm -hmm. eventually everyone moved up and the residence was the centerpiece over the weekend of where they were doing their work and even mm -hmm. Burt Fields and military were coming to the residence. So I was sort of involved in what was going on then. And then, mm -hmm. you know, Sunday night, I, you know, kind of looked like it was getting better. And Monday, things then got worse again. And at that point, I, you know, as a professional lawyer, you know, I was still kind of working and winding down my legal practice at the time. Um, I just jumped right in and I actually went for the next five weeks and I worked um, in the embassy. I uh, went to work every day with John. <laughs> I, I sat in the, uh, on the ninth floor where his office is. I filled in for people that were taking care of their families. A, a lot of the, um, at, a, at a certain point after uh, the embassy families could go and those um, people that needed to also leave uh, for medical reasons or whatever. So mm -hmm. I, answered phones, I helped Suzanne. I mean, Suzanne and I have lots of memories. We stayed up all night, we did all kinds of things. I really worked for five full weeks um, at the embassy, mm -hmm. in addition to um, the things I did to support, you know, the embassy families, the, uh, the expat community, 
uh, getting information out, and I participated in all kinds of it, duties. Yeah, I mean, Susie was definitely right there with us, um, working on an anything and everything. But at the same time, I think it was easy to get into a bubble. You know, we were constantly in meetings uh, with Japanese officials, and then I mean, J John and I were having to do calls so late at night because DC was they had their own schedule and we were trying to be responsive to that. And it's kind of easy to lose track of, of what's going on outside of the embassy. And I think Susie was really well positioned because she had a lot of the connections to the expat community and also her Japanese friends mm -hmm. um, and was able to bring that information, especially in helping us understand how we're coming across, whether our communication was hitting the right messaging uh, and giving us that feedback. Uh, I thought that was one of the many useful things that Susie um, offered during that time. Yeah, can I comment on, on the whole communication piece? Um, <laughs> because we were dealing with um, like CNN, you know, they had a banner countdown to meltdown and mm -hmm. chaos in Japan. And all this information was coming out. Um, some of it was inaccurate, a lot of it was inaccurate. There is a high level of anxiety and even panic among family and friends. And um, we had to sift through and we had to make decisions um, with, with, you know, we wanted to be accurate. We wanted to get information out, um, but we didn't want to cause a panic, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I would constantly consult with Suzanne and Susie and others on things like, um, you know, how to frame uh, the, the facts, um, yeah. you know, and, and what to say and what not to say. At one point I had a nuclear expert come into my office and say, you know, we are an uncharted territory and it could get worse and probably will. Another email I got from an expert was Tokyo could become a contaminated wasteland. Wow. Well, you don't go out with a communication like that. Um, yeah. So you had to figure out how do you be accurate? How do you be quick? Um, and, and Susie and Suzanne should comment on this too. Um, you know, we had, Washington wanted to control the narrative on what we, uh, on what, what press release we put out, et cetera. It didn't work because events were moving so quickly. So we quickly found that before it was in vogue, Twitter was a great device to get out information and YouTube. And if I can just tell one other story that uh, involves Susie, I started uh, doing a YouTube uh, video. Um, and um, right after I did the YouTube, Susie came into this little studio in the embassy and said, you look like crap. You cannot go on again looking like you're exhausted and you know with the background you had so she took over the production <laughs> going well, forward and the production value went up from there all, all hands on deck effort um, you know i mentioned earlier that the 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 dart set in experts one of the experts they sent in and of course we never would have known to ask for it uh, was a com risk communication expert who was from CDC, uh, which makes sense, you know, in the world we're in today, we understand that why they would have risk communicators. And she, I remember she just had this mantra that she used. She was so calm as well, you know, Jana, Jana was her name and she's so calm. And she'd always just say, tell them what you know, tell them what you don't know, tell them what you're doing to find out and, you know, let them know when they're going to hear from you again, and then be sure that they hear from you again at that time. And it was, it seems like such common sense, um, but at the time it was very helpful to have someone who could bring that perspective and share it with us. Oh, that's nice. And kind of speaking um, on, um, no one specifically mentioned a mental health, but um, you know, Susie, you spoke about um, kind of people were sick or taking care of their families. And I know I've heard you speak before Ambassador Roos about you know, your employees had families to take care of as well, in addition to working and, and you were trying to balance that. And um, touching upon that, I know it's well known, Ambassador Roos, that you, uh, Susie and Suzanne, all traveled to Tohoku uh, multiple times to meet with those who were most impacted. And um, we have several photos actually of um, Ambassador Roos and Susie when you were making those visits. And um, it's very clear um, looking at these photos that you care deeply for those you know you met with. And um, yes, you're an ambassador, 
and in this public, um, you know, space, and, uh, space, but you also care deeply. And I was, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, what was the first city that you visited? Um, and what was your first impression upon that visit? Um, maybe we can start with you, investors. Well, I'm looking at these pictures and you, you get a little emotional. Um, just look, particularly that one with uh, the little kids who are smiling. Um, it, it was amazing. You know, you, we've been talking about the interagencies and the military and Washington and communication and everything. But it wasn't until we all traveled up there uh, to the Tohoku region. And the first place we went was Ishinomaki. Um, and um, it was just, you know, unbelievably emotional. And, you know, I tell the story of, uh, I was clearly shaken um, walking into the evac one of the evacuation centers in Nishinomaki. And um, one, it's another picture uh, that you didn't put up, but this young kid, 10 to 12 years old, uh, ran up to me and uh, maybe saw my face and just gave me a hug. And um, that to me was a symbol of those, those young and old people of uh, Tohoku, um, that uh, their resilience, their strength, the incredible tragedy uh, mm -hmm. that they faced. And uh, so that brought it, all those trips, I think we did about a dozen trips or so over the following months. And uh, that all brought it uh, down to the reality, the level of human suffering, but also um, the strength of the Japanese people. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, I mean, it's just so hard. You see the pictures and for those who weren't, who weren't there, the pictures can't really capture what it was really like. It was something that it's unimaginable, the devastation. Mm -hmm. And so that was just really very shocking to me. Um, and I'll, ne I'll never forget that day that I went up there right after it was um, about 10, 12 days after um, the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And uh, Suzanne, I know you also made some visits as well. Did you, I know, especially that uh, photo of you, Ambassador Roos, and you were there as well, uh, Susie, was days after um, in Ishinomaki. That uh, was the 20, it was actually, I know exactly when it was, it was the 23rd of March. Oh, oh today. Go today. It's wow. today the 23rd, right? Yeah. yeah, we went up there on the 23rd of March. Wow. So um, Suzanne, how about for you? I know you made some trips as well. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't make my first trip until June. Um, and I was really um, focused on some of the inside embassy activities and, um, and, and keeping things moving and, and a lot of the kind of communication that we need to do, especially on the nuclear side, I was organizing some of that. So I didn't um, really lift my head up and get out of the embassy uh, and to get up to the region till June. Uh, and even by then, um, so many months later, it was just, there was, it was so, it was very weird because it was very surreal, right? You see nothing and then you hit a line and then you just see utter destruction. And some of it was still just untouched really. And just, and uh, other areas were kind of organized if I could use that word. I mean, things, I mean, you've been up there Shanti as well and you saw it where um, things would be piled up, you know, by metal or um, some of the houses had been cleared. And so you just saw the frames and the, um, and, and like a, a toilet, <laughs> for some reason, the toilets would, you know, be poking up from the ground. Um, so it was still pretty, you know, dramatic, but I, I didn't get up there until several months later. And when we were there, we were able to really have an opportunity to talk to people. We met with some jets who were up in the region. That was extremely impactful for me hearing their stories. And we met with, um, you know, kind of famous, uh, we talk a lot about our meeting with Mayor Toba up in Rikuzen Takata. Um, we met with some of the firemen in Ofunato and we participated in a, a project, a volunteer project as well, um, helping us. So it was a very, um, um, memorable, you know, and life-changing trip for me to really see things in the, in the region. You know, something that, as you can imagine, we were making a million decisions during that period of time. And one of the decisions was when was it appropriate to first travel up to the Tohoku region? Mm -hmm. And I remember we were debating it, you know, on three or four days into 
the crisis. And we came to the conclusion, particularly because we were dealing with an evolving nuclear situation, um, that it was not the right time. And I remember actually having a conversation with uh, Secretary Clinton and um, she, we were talking about the situation and uh, she said to me, you know, hey, if ever you need to bounce any ideas off of me, um, you know, I'm here. And uh, I said, well, I have one right now. You know, what's, what would you think the appropriate timing of our first trip up to the Tohoku region would be? And she asked me what my gut was. <laughs> And I told her, you know, wait a little bit. Um, and, uh, and she said, I'd follow your gut. And then um, that first trip was with Admiral Willard. It was after the Operation Tomodachi had been launched. They had had a um, major accomplishment of clearing the Sendai airport. Um, we took the helicopter tour of the disaster, you know, the coast. Uh, before we landed and went to Ishinomaki and some of these other places. Um, and it felt like we made the right decision, but it's kind of interesting that that one decision had a lot of backdrop mm -hmm. to what the right timing was and uh, the appropriateness of it. Sure. It must have um, been tiring to have to make so many decisions um, all of the time on various you know, things that were so impactful and heard all around the world. Um, speaking of, you know, your time, yes, you were in um, the public eye, of course, but through your stories, we can hear you all met with people, organizations, local communities. And I'm curious, you know, through those experiences that you had during this time, is there anything new um, you learned about the Japanese people or its culture or the US-Japan relationship during that time? Uh, is that addressed to me first? Uh, everybody, but yeah, go ahead. You can take <laughs> the investors. Um, I, I, I think that everyone's talked about it, but uh, it's, it's true. And I saw it, I think we all saw it firsthand, just the strength, the resilience, um, the, how the calmness of confronting that crisis. It was just amazing. Um, but if I can pivot a little to not just the Japanese, but the Americans as well, mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty incredible to me how our whole government and even the people of the United States in so many different ways stepped up mm -hmm. and our military, it, it, was, it was incredible. And then I saw on the military side in particular um, the alliance at work, the Japanese self-defense forces working with uh, our, our military on Operation Tomodachi. And so from both sides of the Pacific, um, I was very impressed, very proud as a representative of the United States. And uh, that really sticks in my mind. Mm. How about for you, Susan? That's easy. Well, okay, well, Suzanne, I think you should talk about the relationships that we saw that were like the foundation of why we were yeah. able to work so closely. Yeah, and it, thank you, Susie. And it's interesting hearing John talk about, you know, his impression of the military. So I had a military background. I'd worked in the Navy and the Pentagon. So I was really happy to see some of the operationalizing of the alliance, but maybe less um, surprised. What for me was most eye-opening was the people-to-people -people relationships. And Prior to March 11th, Ambassador Roos used to give a lot of speeches and, we'd, and he would talk about how, um, you know, the three pillars of the relationship and how he wasn't really worried about, even though news was on Futema, the security and the economic aspects of the relationship, he had confidence in, but the area that he thought we needed to put the most work into was the foundation and people to people relations, exchanges and so forth. And I hear him, you know, I, I understood that, but until March 11th, it wasn't as easy for me in the aftermath of March 11th to see what that really meant. And so for me, the eye-opening piece was how much those people-to-people -people connections, how much that foundational layer of the relationship really mattered. You know, a, a small example is we had this wonderful um, 
uh, radiation oncologist who came to help us with some advice, uh, Norm Coleman, Dr. Norm Coleman. And I remember at one point he said, you know, I need to have this meeting with my Japanese counterpart in order to unlock all these really important things that we needed to get done. And I was like, oh, okay, we'll try to figure out how to find your Japanese counterpart and how to set that up. He's like, oh, don't worry. I know who he is. I've got his name. We've been at conferences before we know each other. You just need to formally set this up so we can, you know, can have this relationship. And it, it really brought home for me how important it was that these relationships between Americans and Japanese extended you know, far before the crisis. And then we were able to leverage that during the crisis. Uh, so to me, that was probably the most eye-opening uh, piece in, of the experience. Yeah, I think, in, you know, it was talked about, we had an event um, earlier this month about Operation Tomorachi with um, Admiral Patrick Walsh and General Oriki, who led, um, you know, both sides of the military during that time. And um, they also noted, um, you know, the importance of, knowing people ahead of time and it's not you know if we don't have these connections and networks um, we can't coordinate as quickly um, and those that's really important and the importance of you know exchanges and things like that to create those connections ahead of time Susie, yeah. And, yeah. yeah and before Susie jumps in i mean people might forget that we had uh, just japan had uh, foreign minister had just resigned what was it sunday or monday before the earthquake on Friday. So we were also, an ambassador was, was having to deal with a new uh, counterpart as the foreign minister. And that's an important relationship that um, you know, was very new at the time. So Susie, I'm sorry. No, 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 I was gonna say that I, I don't really have much to add about you know, what everyone's already said that the foundation of, of, of being able to work together and trust each other is having this underlying relationship. And at so many levels of all the people that came in, like the 150 people, I mean, that's not an exaggeration of brand new people that came in to work with us. They all had their own relationships. And, um, you know, what I was uh, one of the, um, what's a geological foundation, uh, National Geological Survey. Um, I do you remember John when uh, Russ uh, came in, he, he, we, we were friends with them from, from right. the Bay Area. And then he came in to give us all, um, some education about earthquakes and mm -hmm. the fire of whatever that's called, you know, the danger of earthquakes. And he had his own relationship and with people in Tokyo already. And so it, it, it was, um, it just brings down back home that it is important to build these people to people relationships now mm -hmm. because you never know when you're going to need to rely on them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and one thing about the Japanese people and my Japanese friends, I can remember them saying, you know, we, we weren't going, I wasn't going anywhere and John wasn't going anywhere and during the time at the very beginning when they were saying, you know, um, people have to leave, you know, so we might need to evacuate a non-essential staff. And I was like, I, I'm not going anywhere. Um, but the Japanese people and my Japanese friends were like, we're, we're not going anywhere <laughs> either, you know, um, they were very calm. They, you know, they listened to the information. And I think that one of the biggest worries was the safety of the food. Um, mm -hmm. that, that was, I, 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 thinking back on it, that was one of the main things was how good the information was about the food yeah. and how contaminated was the food and how dangerous was that. There was some, you know, issues about whether radiation was in the air. And I, I can remember one thing that during these meetings with the health experts, they were saying you get more radiation from flying into the Denver airport than you get from being in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all of us felt, you know, it was a very dangerous, it was a very, not, not dangerous, it was a very complex situation going on, but we all felt we had like the best information um, and we were operating from a position of, of knowing more what was going on than reading mm -hmm. the CNN banner. Weren't we also told that eating a banana had a higher level of radiation? And I've never been able to eat a banana since then without thinking about <laughs> I, the radiation. I also very specifically remember, I was in the US at the time, but um, I remember that as an example of, um, you know, when they were giving information out. So no bananas for you. <laughs> no, he eats a banana every day. My daughter tells me to eat a banana every day, despite the radiation, I'm not sure if she has a different agenda, but. Uh, I no, want to say one other good 
<laughs> great thing about the Japanese, it's like their standards are so high. That was another thing that came out during all these meetings about safety and health. I know the Japanese people, you know, there's definitely, there was doubts about the whole situation. But when we were talking to the experts, the CDC, the uh, NIH, all, all the FDA, everyone talking about the safety of the food, I can other, also remember they were saying the standards that the Japanese had were so high uh, when they said it was contaminated versus to what we have in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And they referenced the BP oil spill and the contamination in uh the gulf of the fish and they go we really can't go on and say that in america we allow americans to eat all this contaminated fish that's not going to be a great message but that we should feel confident that the standards that the japanese were employing were so much more strict and so much more um serious than the, the ones that we were even applying in the united states mm -hmm. so i remember that about the japanese also yeah i think you know there's um so many lessons and as the uh, you know event title today is resiliency and friendship and I think you know, that's um, so clear through all the stories we've been hearing about. Um, we have just a little bit more time before we jump into Q&A and I just want to say to our audience that we have had some great questions come in so thank you for that. I feel free to keep sending them in and we'll um, get to them very shortly. Um, but it, I think also we sadly lost Suzanne. Yeah, I know. I was going to say, where's Suzanne? She is offline. Um, Benji, if you can hear me, if you can um, coordinate and see if you can make sure that would be great. Um, but in the meantime, you know, Ambassador Russo, I'm curious, as the ambassador at the time, uh, 10 years ago during March 11th, 2011, um, you know, you learned a lot. Uh, you had to go through a lot. And we hope that there will never be a similar event at you know, such a crisis, such a level. Um, but it's probably likely that there'll be some sort of event where the US and Japan uh, needs to collaborate quickly again. And I'm just curious if um, you know, the situation were to arise again, what kind of advice would you have for the then ambassador who would be leading the US? Well, the, I see Suzanne is back. Um, <laughs> the, the advice I, had, I would have is number one, the advice that Hillary Clinton gave me to follow your instincts. But second of all, to really listen to the experts, to draw on those expertise, but don't necessarily accept everything you're told at face value. You need to challenge, you need to push, you need to probe. Um, you're also the whole personal side of the equation is very important. You are um, the face of the United States. And I remember the head of uh, DART, um, the disaster assistance response team, when he first came into my office and they arrived in Tokyo. And I said, you know, what's the advice, uh, what advice you have for me? And he said, first and foremost, take care of yourself and make sure your team takes care of themselves because if you guys aren't sharp uh, and on your game, you can't provide the leadership that you need to provide. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I didn't take that totally to heart because for the first five days, we were talking about the lack of sleep. I really didn't sleep. But I began to feel that, um, that how important that was and how important that was for all of us um, mm -hmm. that were in the middle of that. And so that is some of the advice I would give to a new ambassador. Mm -hmm. Then any, from your perspective, I'm so glad you're back. Um, the, the, the question was, you know, we hope that there would never be a similar disaster, uh, but if the unfortunate uh, situation mm -hmm. arises, you know, as in the positions you had, what advice would you give to those who would be in those positions at the time? Well, that's a, a really good question. I think, and I hope I'm not repeating things that have already been said, uh, but the, you know, being able to get the right voices to the decision makers is, is challenging and important. And, um, you know, we, I mentioned earlier the challenge of, you know, finding who the right um, sources of information were and getting that information to the ambassador. And you can make some wrong decisions there and cut off a really important source of information. 
especially if you don't like what, what you're hearing, right? So it's very important to have a process to make sure that all the voices are heard. And one of the things, and I, I, I think a lot of it is Ambassador Russo's background as a lawyer, um, you know, he would bring in people who had different views on very key issues and have them discuss it in front of him. And then he could ask the probing questions to find why maybe there wasn't as much difference as it seemed at first because there were different assumptions. Or, and and I, I've heard a lot of other people say that they feel that one of the most successful um, parts of the US response was the fact that ambassadors allowed the experts to get their views to him. And he didn't always agree and he didn't always take their advice, but he gave them a chance to explain their thoughts and they felt heard. And I think that allowed him to make better decisions. And, and um, I, I think we, I kind of wish in that first dart, they had sent a science advisor perhaps, um, and somebody who really had the ability to start with more knowledge about the science and, and that was necessary and help ask the right questions and guide ambassadors on that. I mean, we had to kind of school ourselves on the fly a little bit. Uh, and I think that that would be the one piece of advice I would say is, is bring out a science advisor. And um, Susie, how about you? Any advice for the wife of the ambassador or husband of the ambassador? <laughs> well, um, you know, from my perspective, you know, just be there to be a sounding board for John, to be supportive of him, to, I mean, to remind him that he needed to, to get sleep and take care of himself. I think I was trying to do that, trying to understand like the um, anxiety of everyone involved. So it wasn't just, um, it was the families, it was the employees, it was the, the expat community. So I think you just have to be mindful that, that everyone hears these things differently and everyone responds to the risk situation differently. Being a lawyer and, and being involved in, you know, tort litigation, I always, you know, there's risk to everything. All of us know we walk out of the street and get in our car, we, we you know, we have a risk. And so I was <clears throat> a little bit more used to the understanding that there's risk with everything and everyone has their own threshold of how much risk they can take. And I think we're all seeing this in the United States right now with yeah. COVID, you know, some people are still, you know, really worried about it. And some people are willing to take it. It's just all a level of risk. And so I think just being open to that, the mental and the, mm -hmm. the, uh, that, that ability to under try to put yourself in the other person's shoes and then we all don't view the situation the same way. Sure. All right. And um, it's already 1247. So I'm going to jump uh, to our Q&A. So again, feel free to send in questions or comments. Uh, we have some here. And this first one um, kind of plays off of what we were just speaking about. But the question is, in the disinformation age, arguably leading to a lack of trust in government, how do you think the risk management strategy would be different today than it was 10 years ago? Dan, you want to take that? Well, let me just say one thing, Suzanne, before you start, you Thank can think you. about your answer. So everyone has to remember 10 years ago, I mean, we had Twitter, but it wasn't like it is today. So we had just kind of started our own Twitter accounts. I mean, it was just beginning and it wasn't, I don't think a fountain of disinformation at that time. It was a, it was mm -hmm. really kind of, I think what it was meant to be a, an, an avenue where people can get information out. And just from a private citizen, um, looking at the, the bureaucracy that we were in at the time, you know, at the beginning, everything flowed really fast. And then the bureaucracy came in and we were having a hard time getting our statements out because it had to go through all these layers of people signing off on this word and that. And we jumped on Twitter and we jumped on Twitter and we jumped on YouTube and maybe it was a hole at that time, but it worked and we could get our message out. And um, I mean, I think Twitter was, you know, John, you've got a great Twitter story, don't you, about um, getting some information and saving some people. Yeah, off of a well, tweet we, that we forwarded, we got a tweet back and we forwarded it on to the military and they reacted from the tweet. And we believe, we never that confirmed it, um, but it helps uh, it helped address a crisis situation, potentially save some lives. You know, I think on the, you know, the, the lessons back then and they still hold today. And Suzanne was talking about, you know, you want to be timely, tell them what you know, tell them what you don't know. Um, be accurate. Don't be, uh, don't, you know, don't, you know, create a panic. Um, but also don't hold back information. 
And I think that those same principles um, apply today as they applied 10 years ago. And uh, it's probably even more complicated, as Susie just said, because of the misinformation has only grown yeah. um, in the last 10 years. So it's probably even more challenging than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, I, it's really an interesting perspective, right? Because I feel like our family members who didn't speak Japanese um, and other ex people who didn't speak Japanese that were in Tokyo, they felt like they didn't have as much information. I think today there probably would be so much information. How do you swim through it and find what you listen to? And um, I think there were a lot of people who didn't realize when you were in a foreign country, there's a way for you to sign up to get notices as Americans to get notices from whatever your local US embassy or consulate is and get updates. And I would def I always recommend to people I know and they're traveling abroad to, to sign up for those communication systems because I have great confidence in the information that you get from the government uh, and from the State Department. It's the best information that they're able to provide. Their, they care about their citizens. And so I, you know, I just think that's an important place for Americans abroad to connect to their embassies. Mm -hmm. Right, and one thing maybe you don't, I mean, I didn't know that they can't tell anything to their employees mm -hmm. that they're not going to tell the public. So it's the same information. It's not like they can give a special message to the people that work for the embassy that they don't put out for the public. It's all the mm -hmm. same information. And so they care about their employees and their uh, families. So that you can have confidence in that. For the general public to know <laughs> that that right. is, is the guideline. Standard. Yeah. Um, so we have another uh, question from um, Ambassador John Malott. Um, he says, Ambassador Roos, you said that Japanese citizens were looking to the U.S. for accurate information. Could you expand on that comment, please? I think that one will probably come back to bite me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, because the, the, there was a, and I don't want to generalize, but there was a feeling of um, a lack of full trust. Um, and what was happening uh, with regard to the Japanese response. Um, you know, there was a lot of chaos going on and there was a lot of criticism. And so again, a lot of the information that was coming um, from us was perceived as kind of neutral or, you know, in, in that regard. And so um, we felt not only, you know, a special obligation, any information that we sent out may have been designed for the 150,000 Americans that were there and the 50,000 military and their dependents. But you, you don't draw a box around where that information goes. So when we were pushing out information, we were fully aware of the fact um, that Japanese citizens um, were relying on it. And I think at one point in time, uh, some of the tweets we were sending out were the fourth most retweeted wasn't it something like that? Um, mm -hmm. Fourth most retweeted tweets in the world. And that is because it was spreading uh, not only among the American citizens, but the Japanese citizens as well that mm -hmm. came to root, that at least relied partially on the information that we were um, sending out. Uh, Suzanne, anything to add to that due to your role at the embassy or? No, I mean, just we were mindful of that. So we were very careful that if we said anything different than what the government of Japan was saying, we had to think about what that would signal to people. Um, but that didn't stop us from putting out what we thought was the best information we could. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if I could add one other thing, because in these 10 year look backs, um, I've gotten questions like, um, what did when Prime Minister Khan went to the nuclear site and was massively criticized for going to the nuclear site um, during you know, a critical period when they were addressing the situation. You know, what was the US view? And I don't know, generally, I mean, everyone had different views, but my personal view was uh, I didn't find it out of the ordinary mm -hmm. that the prime minister of Japan would go uh, you know, to show what he believed to be leadership at the time. So, you know, but the Japanese people, there was a lot of criticism of that. So again, that came in and all the different information that was coming out fast moving that contributed to, um, you know, the lack of trust in mm -hmm. the situation that, um, that hopefully we helped address in a small way. 
Do you feel that there was a kind of just going deeper into this question, a pivotal point um, where trust was gained back a bit or, um, you know, that people felt, okay, we can really trust this information coming from? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, if you look at the Japanese polls at the time, um, they were very challenging for the government. And obviously after that, um, there was a change in government, um, you know, within a couple of years, I think a couple of years. So um, I, I don't know the answer to, you know, when uh, there was a, a change in confidence uh, in the government in that regard. Mm -hmm. I mean, Suzanne, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't have anything to add. So. All right. So we only have uh, five minutes left, and I just wanted, to, before closing, um, have each of you share, I'm sure it's hard to do one, uh, but a takeaway from, you know, your experience you had in Japan at that time that you'll always carry with you. It could be a memory, a lesson learned, um, but something that just really stays with you to this day. Uh, Susie, would you like to start us off? Well, um... I just am going to say, I mean, other than what I've, I've said about the Japanese people and my appreciation for their strength and their resilience, a, a personal story to me and mm -hmm. something that um, has had an impact on my life since then is that um, this was the first time that John and I actually worked together. So we both were professionals. I was a, a working attorney and mom and he was a working attorney, but we had never actually been in business together. And so this these five weeks um that i was working in the embassy with him and then from then on i mean we really teamed up i was really involved in a lot as suzanne can tell you a lot of the a lot of what was going on in the embassy and we just saw that we were a good team i mean i felt we were a good team on a professional level and mm -hmm. and since then we came back and to a the personal States. level so they were a good team <laughs> oh both. We already knew that. We've been married almost 40 years, okay. but I'm talking about professional. Just too. for the record. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're just about to set out, celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary, but we started a business together. And so for, since we returned from Japan, uh, mm -hmm. we've been working together. Um, we were still married, but anyway, that was one of the personal um, yeah. lessons that, you know, that I'll always remember is that I was able, we were able to accomplish that together. That's great. Ambassador Roos, would you like to? Well, just, uh, I'll tell you a memory, but one of the things that I'm most proud of and is in large part because of Suzanne, who is uh, here with us, is um, we, we saw the incredible success of uh, Operation Tomodachi on the military side. And we took that name and that brand that was developed uh, and started the Tomodachi Initiative. And really, uh, uh, again, because of Suzanne and others' leadership impacted the lives of thousands of young people. And just one scene I will never forget was uh, when we had the launch, we, it was a public-private, is a public-private partnership, and we were raising a lot of money from the private sector. And um, we had a who's who of Japanese business uh, leaders who had contributed to Tomodachi at the embassy. And um, a young woman named Ayaka, uh, who had lost uh, some of her family in the tsunami, gave a speech that brought corporate Japan standing behind her um, to tears. And they were all choked up and it was an amazing sight. And just yesterday, I got a picture, I was sent a picture of Ayaka, who now has, is now married with two young children of her own. And, um, and I just got an email saying she would like to speak to me or reach out to me by email in the next couple of days. So it's just, uh, I'm incredibly proud that together all of us were to create something out of that tragedy that um, survives and thrives to this day. Thank you. It's a very touching story. Suzanne? I have to go after those two answers. It's tough. Um, I, you know, building on the Tomodachi, though, for me, 
I mentioned earlier, kind of having, I'm very committed to US Japan relations as an alliance manager and getting an appreciation for the people to people relations. And, and then Tomodachi was our startup as, as John used to refer to it. And so like many, many people, I, I made some career choices after the impact of 311. And you know, I ended up moving to US Japan Council and working in nonprofit work. Um, you know, and my path has brought me back to USJC in the last year. Um, so for me, there, there's a huge impact in that I, I shifted how I contribute to US Japan relations based on that experience. And I know that's true for you as well, Shanti, as I understand it. And for really actually a lot of people um, and probably many of the people who are listening to us today are able to reflect on their own choices that they've made as a result of the 311 experience and how it's it's given them a different trajectory. And that's, that's the same for me. Right, well, thank you so much. It's already uh, 1 p.m. here in DC, um, 10 a.m. on the West Coast where you all are at. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your stories um, and your time with us. And on behalf of Sasaka Peace Foundation USA, I'd like to also thank um, all of those who've joined us from across the US and even some in Japan at such a late hour. Uh, we really appreciate your time with us. Um, and in closing, as we recently crossed the 10 year mark of March 11, 2011, I hope we can all find our own ways to keep the candlelight of remembrance bright for the lives lost while reflecting, reflecting on the resiliency and hope that lives on in those who were impacted by all that occurred that fateful day. So thank you again uh, very much to the three of you. It was wonderful to chat and I look forward to seeing you in person, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. So everyone out there, thank you, stay safe and be well. <laughs>